the voice of electricity. Ten million volt artificial lightning as produced by General Electric in its research laboratory. This is station W2XAF, an international broadcast station owned and operated by the General Electric Company in Schenectady, New York. of you may never be attracted to the likes of me but accidents will happen and I'll be around and maybe there'll be no one else but me around forevermore may never start you may ignore my hopeful heart and chances are I'm not the one to make you fall but accidents will happen after all a smile may show it your eyes may glow before you know it I'm sure I'll know so if you fall in just that way oh wouldn't I be thrilled to hear you say I had a lovely accident today But accidents will happen and I'll be around And maybe there'll be no one else but me around And chances are I'm not the one to make you fall But accidents will happen after all A smile may show it, your eyes may glow Before you know it, I'm sure I'll know So if you fall in just that way Oh, wouldn't I be thrilled to hear you say I had a lovely accident the most improbable accident I had a lovely accident today Welcome once more to my house of horror Last week I told you of a woman driven to despair by the sound of a telephone whose ringing chilled her to the bone. This week, it's another sound that chills. The haunting sound of a drumbeat from the past. Our story is set on Salisbury Plain, a place which indeed abounds in strange stories. And the period? Well, the younger man sports a tarred pigtail and the elder a monstrous tattoo on his arm, which shows Bonaparte hanging from a gibbet. Although at the time of my story, Bonaparte himself is still alive and well. Come with me then on a stormy night to Salisbury Plain and to the legend of the dead drummer. 
I'd not be to see you on a night like this. Tis a fair storm and no mistake. We should have stuck to the roads. There's little shelter out here on the plain. And little, he says. There's none as I can see. Still, he who's soaked to the skin has no fear of a wetting, they say. That's yes. a sea wetting they spoke of. There's naught to a sea wetting. And land wetting's different. The cheerly man. Look yonder. No. Take that away, post. I think it be. Now, let's see what it's to tell us. Good or bad. That's rare difficult writing, Matthew. There's numbering figures mixed up in there, too, some Hush, wonder. man, I'm reading. This way post tells us we're to Lavington this way and devises that. What do tether arms say? The writing's worn quite away there, but the figure says one mile. It must be worth a man's labor to reach it if it's signposted so. An inn, do you think? You never know in these parts. They're just as likely to signpost a pond or a swamp or somebody's grave as any hostelry. <laughs> That sound. Aye? That noise, then. I heard noise. There it is again. Aye, ah, I heard it. Was it. was it. To naught, to thunder, plain and simple. It were him, Matthew. It were thunder, I say. And he's coming closer. Then step out, man, for God's sake. Thunder, old bogey man. I want to be under cover when it do come. Wait, Matthew! Matthew, wait! There! If that ain't the best sight I ever did see! Is anyone home, do you think? It's an inn, man, bound to let us in wherever the hour. Well, that's true enough for town. It's different here. Lonelier, see. What if we was robbers, Matthew? Shh, hush, man. I'll try the door. But I tell you, there's no one at home. Wait. What's up, Matthew? A light. Up there at the window. Let me do the talking. Do it, and welcome. Who's below? Two travellers soaking wet. I can see that much. Where you from? From the walls, indirectly. What are you doing on Salisbury Plain on such a night? To answer you truly, landlord, we was getting lost. Well, you're not the first to stray off the paths. <laughs> you shall be the last. <laughs> uh, may we rest here a while? Take some ale? Share your fire? I'll come down. Uh, what did I tell What's you? What's o'clock, done? Matthew? In no way of telling. Landlord looked bound for bed. Are we money enough to stay here? We'll talk about that. <laughs> Keep your <laughs> mouth shut about your fancies. Don't say a word, you understand? Whatever it is out there is not what you think. But I heard... You are the voice of the storm, nothing more. Now, oh, she. Uh, very well, Matthew. Come in, come in. Oh, thank you kindly, Landlord. And your friend? Hey, boy! <laughs> Hi, hi! Oh, it's bitter, truly. Uh, I trust we did not disturb your rest or wake the mistress of the house. Well, there's no mistress, I'll leave you alone. I went to bed betimes, thinking there'd be no one foolish enough to walk abroad on such a night. Uh, well, you reckon without us, didn't you, Billy boy? Hi, hi, Matthew. <laughs> You're a sailorman, do I take it? Correct in every detail, landlord. Was it the AI gave us away? No, there's other clues. Huh? Your collar is stained with tar. Your oh. trousers is bows up together and guiltless of braces. <laughs> and besides, you have that pigeon-toed step of nautical men. <laughs> and I'd wager your friend's a marine. Uh, a jolly. By <laughs> God, landlord, but you're a marvel and no mistake. <laughs> How could you tell that? I can't rightly say. There's simply something about him that savours more of the pipe clay than the pitch. Hear that, Billy boy? I do, Matthew. Uh, but place yourself by the fire, gentlemen. Oh, and this, uh, I'll, uh, I'll poke it into life again. You'll be requiring a jar directly, I'm sure. Uh, I'll fetch it for you, and uh, then I'll go and warm your batch. Landlord, I, you'd best say what this is costing hard cash for we're wandering men, and though the king be dear to us, we don't carry his picture to any great extent. I do what I can for those who has fought for their country. That's right, civil of you, sir. Not civil, no. But most of us who stayed behind, safe behind doors, has cause to thank them as went to fight in the wars. And put old Boney where he belongs. Yeah. My indoor will never be close to such as you and your friend. You hear that, Billy? Huh? Did I hear what? 
What the kind gentleman said, ain't that a Christian spirit that he has on him? Uh, that's for certain, sure, Matthew. Is he ill, your companion? He no. looks powerful, pale. Not ill, bless you, sir. Simply tired with the journey. Ah. Well, I'll uh, mull up some ale. Uh, that'll what'll suit you best. Fair enough. <laughs> See to your friend, why don't you? Aye, yeah, that I shall. Come, Billy. Come sit beside me. Storm's getting closer. What are you doing to cry out like that? This man will warm us and feed us, don't you understand? Don't have him question us. What's there to say? Uh, what's there to say, say you? One thing's for sure, your lullers choose those things to say that folks want to hear the least. Do you think landlord would be so anxious to please if he knew what sort of man he had under his roof? Matthew! Don't put a name to her. Then, then don't be so free to take the name upon yourself. What? Murderer? No, no one could call you that. Some would. You can't stop him. Who then would say it? He. Who? He with a drum. There's no drum, damn you. What do you hear is thunder. I, I thunder, but beat upon a drum. Nothing of the sort. His snare drum. Isn't that what you call it? A right tight little side drum what sits at a lad's hip? You know well enough. I do that. And I know too that that's the sound I do hear. Say you. Not thunder. Are you so sure? Listen. <laughs> thunder. A drum. Rattling the shutters and the windies. <laughs> necessities. A drum. Thunder, I tell you. Are you mad, Matthew? Are you? <laughs> I... I am, I reckon I am, for I hear that drummer boy coming closer, ever closer, out there over the plain. He's after me, sure. It's the sound of your own conscience, I'm thinking. Who taught my conscience to play the drum? Now there. Oh, this will warrior. <laughs> hey, look, fresh mouth. Thank you kindly, landlord. You're most welcome. Uh, will you keep us company here by the fire? Gladly. Billy, come away from that window. Sit yourself down. Very well. Oh, a good brew that, ain't it, Billy boy? Hi. I'm glad it pleases you. It does, don't it, Billy? Hi. I'm passing to a drop myself. I don't blame you one jot. You put life into the dead, it will. Hush, man, sit down. What do you mean? Hush, I say. Life and the dead, what do you mean by that? <laughs> no, no, my soul. You yearing, Billy, he meant nothing by it. Very well. Very well. And sit down, do, and beg his pardon. Pardon, my lord. Granted. Right, that. What thought you, I meant, though, sir? But nothing, nothing. He thought nothing. That's a fault in him. Matthew. He will speak before he thinks. Yes, so I can see. And now she's out with those great hands of his, I shouldn't wonder. I'd not like to be at the end of his uh, temper. Uh, well, I tell you, square landlord, he's gentle as a lamb. To you, perhaps, but you, you surely have the measure of him. Well, we've been shipmates, see. They say that you really get to know a man, a shipboard. I know him like a brother. He's nervous now, but he'll be better directly. <laughs> See it him start when the thunder rolls. It's simply his way. Why, he's as pale as a ghost. I do hear him, Matthew. Pale as a ghost. Ain't that a good one? Hush. <laughs> What's his meaning? He's tired. He's walked far today. We're no further than you. We shipmate, sure. I measure him pace for pace. And there's another reason for his fancy. Fancy? What fancy? A drummer boy, damn you! Matthew, you said there were no drummers. No! Billy! What drummer boy is it? It's nothing. A, a dream he it, has. It's more than a dream, I can tell. I can tell. Tell him my tale, Matthew. You want me to? Aye. Your friend's right, you know. If there's something bothering him, it's best to have it out in the open. Uh, it's an ordinary enough tale. Tell him, Matthew. Uh, it's your tale, rightly. Tell him! Billy here uh, weren't all as a jolly. He started out as a soldier and a good and corporal, were not you? Sergeant. See, Sergeant. Well trusted, seemingly, and when a job came up for a good, stout, reliable, sober fellow, Billy'd be chosen. He's an air about him, I grant you. One day, there's a command for him to take a charge of weight to a detachment a dozen mile away or more. A regimental pain, old lass, and other gear packed onto a string of mules. A grave responsibility. Billy was up to it. But he needed a companion for the way. They chose the young drummer boy to go with him, for he could sing like a bird and play and jest and while the time away. Brand were his name. Abel Brand. Go on. 
You don't want me to tell it, Bill? No. Well, they paused by the way in a little wood, was it? That's right, I... Under some trees to keep the sun off their heads while they shared a rough meal, for this was in warmer climes than ours. Bread and cheese and water from the brook hard by. And this is what makes the tale. There were bandits in them parts. Bandits? Who roved in bands, robbing travellers. Well, they'd not touch a soldier in uniform. Were they gone about him, surely? That's a hard part for Billy there, being warm, as I said, and the rest being due. He slipped a rifle off his shoulder. Leaned it against a rock, took off his belt with a bane, and rested it down. And then they struck. They did. I can still hear his cries. And they killed him, the drummer. Spit him on their swords, the heathens. Your shipmate there? Fought like the deuce, but there were too many. I ran. I ran and ran. Don't take it bad. You're no coward, Billy. I ran, I tell you. No reason you shouldn't. Not if the lad was dead. Oh, he was dead, all right. Only question is... What? Why don't he stay so? <laughs> the thunder still troubles you, hmm? Thunder, you call it? What else would you have me call it? <laughs> I know no other word. Thunder, indeed. He's only trying to help you. Tell him to... Watch it. Make it stop. <laughs> well, there's many tales of folk trying to pose over the weather, and not one of them but looked a fool for his pains. Don't worry, man. Storm will flow over soon. But he'll still be there. Billy, no! Friends! He's all of a trap. Look. Do you not see him? There! There! He's so proud and sniffing his mark. Do you not see him? Come on, sit down, sit down. Come on, sit down. Yeah. Sit down. Uh, <laughs> If you can see aught out there in this pitch, you're better than I. A drummer boy, indeed. I saw him, I saw him. Oh, very well, so you did. I'm scared. Well, there's none likes to see a sprite. But what arm should this one wish you? He's come for me, that's what. Nonsense, man. Him and his damnable drum. He's come with his ratter plan to take me down to hell. What talk is this? You did him no harm, Billy. Indeed, you did not. And I, I tell you, ghosts is many things, but they always have a logic to what they do. They'll not carry you off for no reason, I promise you. Is it reason you want? Put your mind at rest, sir. Reasons? You did all that you could for him, seemingly. Aye, all that a man can do for another. What means he by that? He, nothing, he's wandering. You don't know they half. Neither on you do. But he do. You can't fool a drummer, boy. You can't fool young Abel Brown. Why should we wish to? Oh, Matthew, Matthew. You're like a brother to me. You take care of me because you think I'm something crap, but I've a knowledge in my soul you never even dreamed of. There he goes again. Best take no notice. Aye. Why stir things up? Everyone's happy the way things are. No one wants it changed, do they? Huh? Of course not, Billy. <laughs> Wrong, Matthew. He do. You hear him now? Oh, no, I hear thunder. And? The ensign swinging, uh, the rain lashing the wall. The drum, for God's sake, the drum. He's powerfully troubled. He's been like this afore, best to humor him. Do you not hear it? I hear it, sure, landlord. Uh, I too, I. Huh? Tap to his rhythm, then. I, uh, I have not the skull. Matthew. No, right. Liars! You hear nothing. I told you what we hear. You bought to believe it. He's outside now. He's come as far as he will. Now, he will wait. For what? For me. It has only my fear protects me now, for it keeps me awake. And he'll not take me open-eyed. He's a heavy conscience, your friend. Ah, seemingly. He'll wait till my eyelids droop. And sneak in by the chink of a casement. And off with my soul like an old sea vest and jump. Out the window they go together. Answer me, sir. I, landlord? Tell me true. What wrong did you do, young man? What wrong? Did he not tell you he ran off and left him to die? That's not all. No? No. There's maybe a detail or so I left out. Billy, take care. No point in denying. I left him, it's true. But How? In a coward's way. How? With no thought but for my own safety and... How? With a six inch of steel in his ribs. Who put it there? I did. You murdered him? With a six inch steel in his ribs? I. 
The bandits played no part in it? Uh -huh. There never was no bandits. You stabbed him in cold blood then? Oh, Billy boy. I had to, don't you see? He had a secret. You killed to learn this secret? No. Why then, why? So the others would not learn. Was it so terrible? Terrible in its consequence. In itself, quite ordinary. What? What was it? A knowledge. A knowledge of what I intended. Oh, Billy, you lad. intended? Oh, ain't it obvious, man, to rob the mills of their packs, take the money and what else of value? Wave goodbye to the flag. Not so foolishly, the flag waves back. <laughs> you refuse to act with you. Young Brand. Well, he were young. He couldn't see the necessity of her. He'd not endured it all the same time as I. He were green. So you cut him down? Oh, not just like that. I had qualms. And to spare. Don't make me out a mindless beast. You slew him in cold blood. Oh, your words, Mr. But taint so. The blood pumped hot in my veins. This here in my brow has not done throbbing since. But I couldn't let him go. Don't you see? He'd have told all. What difference would it have made? They'd soon know enough that with their money gone, wouldn't need a young lad to tell them. He told them more dead than alive. Well, that's true, landlord. That's very true. I tell you someone else. He still does. He still tells them all they want to know. Don't you hear? Quiet, you demon. If I can kill you once, I can kill you twice. I got the knife here still, see? Mercy on us. Put it down, Billy. Never. I hung on to this always. I had it all the time I lived in the hills with a deserter's bounty on my head. Then when I... Ah, what Catch happened you. next? Catch your creatures, gonna fight. Oh, let me be. Huh? I mustn't close my eyes, do you see? I mustn't close my eyes. You can't fight nature, man. Oh, can I so? Nature created Abel Brand, I think, yet I reversed the process. <laughs> ah, so, so then I... Then Stay I, the old friend. Then I... Ah, I come home. Some of the money remains, see? I drank it away. The wee drummer, you see. He never let me rest. I drank one night in a bar with, with sailors. Well, the press, they come and took me. I didn't care. They were soldiers, see, young Grand. At sea, I was safe. He didn't follow you to sea? Never. He's a land demon only. Dear Christ. Now the wars are done. Hard to find a ship. Hard to find... What, Billy? Rest. He's done in. <coughs> It's a, it's a fit, isn't it? So you just wore himself out. A bad conscience can do that to a man. Yeah, we'll come and biscuit him up to bed. You, you don't mind? Oh, no, no, we've got no choice. Well, we can't turn out the door, can we? You believe in the demon. I don't believe nor disbelieve. It's better thus. You take his legs and pick that knife of his up. It gives me the creeps. Here, get him upstairs. Go this way. Shoot us first. He's a big fellow, your friend, and strong. That he is, and a useful man in the rigging. A fearful thing a man's conscience is when it sours. A true landlord, too. Uh, careful now. Careful. You had no knowledge of this? None, I swear. But I did know... What? Well, he was subject to dreams and terrors, and at once he'd been rich. He pays for all fortune in the end. This way with him. Big bed there. Right. I just noticed. What did you notice? Thunder stopped. Aye, for present. But nothing's to be read by that. All thunder stops sometime. Go on gently now. All right. Stay there. That's it. Shall I take his shoes off? Better. His eyes is closed. Well, that's natural. He didn't want them closed. Put him in mortal fear. Not we can do. You can close the eyes of the dead, but you can't open the eyes of the living. What are you doing? His uh, jack. He won't need that. Asleep. He likes to have it always under his pillow. It won't do him any good. If there's a demon, indeed. Not gone, seemingly. Not yet. There, Billy. 
There's your knife to keep you safe. Come on, come on, let's let him be. A charm would work better than a knife, I'm thinking. You have one? I don't believe in it myself, not really good extent, you know. But you have one. A dolly somewhere, I. Uh, could he have it? Huh? It's just for tonight. <laughs> I suppose so, I. Uh, where is it now? There, over the, the bar. Door, yeah. <clears throat> That's it. Farmers and folk to set great store by days. <laughs> it's quaintly woven. I do not use to. I'll take this up and put it by his bed against the sprite. <laughs> he don't believe in charms. He nails one up on a beam. And I don't believe in spirit drummer boys that are yours and right enough. Stars, there's no mistake, he's going away. He's going away. Abel Brand. Abel Brand, he's leaving, sure. But why? Because of the charm or because his work is done? Oh my god. Landlord! What's the matter? I was too late. The wee drummer got there first, seemingly. What do you mean? His throat is cut. From ear to ear. Where's O'Neill? Billy! Really? Uh, do you not go up there? It's not an instructive sight. I've been in battle, man. I've seen the worst can happen. It is not the blood, nor the smiling cut I spoke of. But the expression on his face. I'll not forget that as long as I live. Uh, wasn't an easy job at sea. All peaceful looks like he went in his sleep. He did go in his sleep, poor lad. Hey, what's that? The big pardon, Undertaker. I was admiring your mystery. Oh, well, take a last look, see then. I'll nail him up and not. Yeah, do it straight away, if you please. All my prayers is said. Yeah, they do say of all men, sailors is the quickest of prayer. Have to be, I reckon, if a great wave or a great fish be coming at you. Undertaker. Hi. I have to tell you this, that neither he nor I had sufficient funds to see you paid. Leastways, not as you deserve. <laughs> None could pay that much, son. I mean, we have no. That's no worry to me. You surely didn't come here out of charity. Ah, oh, no, not for charity. No, charity is a little used word in my trade. Then who shall pay you? I'll pay... Explain yourself. The innkeeper saw me right. The landlord here? He's a soft-hearted one, is Jed. And powerful, generous to such as have worn the king's uniform. Aye, that we've learned for ourselves. He had a son, a little lad he lost in the wars. Reckon he thinks he owes it to his memory to care for the military, so to speak. The little lad? Killed in action. They say old Jed's hair turned colour overnight. Drummer boy, you were? Jed? Landlord here. Jed Brand. Aye, such is my name. <laughs> <laughs> Scared you, did I? Here, work's not done. I'll just time down. <laughs> You seem in a cheerful mood, Undertaker. Uh, why not? It is not my friend lies there. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell, then. <clears throat> oh, and uh, thank you. Any time, Jed Brand. Walk on your own man. <laughs> Well, sir, I could wish your stay had been a happier one. It's 
bad for an inn when two arrive for the night and one departs in the morning. He called you Bran. Why not? I mean, that's my handle, as they say. That's what the lad was called, Brand. Abel Brand. It's a common enough name. Is it? Oh, aye, in these parts, aye. What's troubling you, sir? Well, you've gone powerful pale. When... When you end up in Billy's room with the charm... That my boy lured his killer here? And I cut his throat? Is that what you're thinking? Why not? You had cause enough. I'll tell you why not. Because I'm an innkeeper, that's why not. I'm proud of my calling. We have standards, we landlord folk. Murder, as I think you'll agree, sir. Well, say on, damn you. Say on. Murder, sir, is the most fearful breach of hospitality. Most fearful. Murder isn't always a breach of hospitality, of course. Otherwise, you wouldn't allow me into your home each week with my tales of terror. In the tale you've just heard, the part of Matthew was played by Ray Smith, Billy Boy by Christian Rodska, and the landlord by Glyn Houston. The undertaker was David Buck, who also wrote the story based on one of the Inglesby legends. The Dead Drummer was directed by Martin Jenkins. And I am Edward D'Souza, your man in black, inviting you to listen next week to the nightmare story of The Dispossessed Daughter. Being taken for a little swing by a girl. Oh, what a terrible woman she is, Mr. Raymond. Oh, now, listen, I like Emily. She's so inventive. Most women will do anything for a necklace, but only Emily knows what to do with a necklace. <laughs> now, please. You know very well that the only thing you can do with a necklace is wear it. Oh, yeah. Well, the only thing you can do with Lipton tea is drink it. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and, Mr. Raymond, maybe you don't realize how often folks do drink Lipton tea. Why, it's the perfect beverage for so many occasions. And that's why it makes sense to have a good supply on hand to buy the larger, more economical size packages. And it is more economical that way, too. Oh, yes. It's wise to have a large size package of Lipton tea on your shelf because that well-known brisk flavor, that bracing, full-bodied taste, makes Lipton's always welcome. Hmm. That uh, gives me an idea. Maybe we should have had Emily and little Daisy talk out their quarrel over a cup of Lipton tea. <laughs> Oh, man, that'd be chummy.
Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the rumor gets around that summer has begun, Broadway is beside itself with glee. Somebody notices the sunlight and tells somebody else, and the word gets around. It drifts cross town, and a man reaches into his closet for a hand organ puts the funny hat on his monkey and takes a walk up to Broadway just to grind out background music for the big grin. It's the time for the dachshund and the silken ankle and the flowered print dress. The orange juice is sweeter, the knish is lighter, and a guy runs down the street screaming, I'm in love. It's June. And it was June under the Translux, too, a rare day. And the Times Square crowd had gathered there to consider it and take the story of it home to the little woman, dad and mom. There was a man lying in the circle of their feet. He was expensively dressed. He's dead, Danny. What happened, Mugovan? Ah, come on, come on, you people. Break it up. Come on, get going. What is it with them, Danny? What happened? How can you tell what happened? People milling around, crossing streets, going to lunch, looking at the wand ads over there in the Times building. Suddenly a guy's face down on the pavement. Somebody laughs, drunk. Somebody sees blood. So we got him on the pavement and them watching. Uh, stabbed. Yeah. Know who he is? Uh-huh. Here, wallet. Loads of identification. Yeah. Earl Lawson, Park Avenue. Earl Lawson. Earl Lawson stocks some bonds. He's got a name. Wizard or something. Makes money by the buckets. Anybody see it happen? A million people on Times Square. High noon, nobody saw anything. Nobody. Now, look, you people, why don't you move along? Go home. Get out of here. The safest place in the world to kill somebody, Mugovan, in a crowd. Walk up to him, stab him in the back, keep walking. Well, it started off to be a pretty day. Yeah, real sunny. And just across the street, the file of crowd waiting for the movie that was better than life held on close to its place in line. Held on close against the insinuating whisper of the violent dead. It was a trick, kid. A trick to make you lose your place, to cheat you out of a front row seat where love and beauty and other high-class things are handed you on an air-conditioned platter. But a few were sold by the whisper and were drawn by it and joined the cluster attending the dead man. A woman pushed her way close and turned away. She opened her purse, smeared a lipstick nervously across her lips, studied their reflection in a window, and then carefully, carefully retraced them with the perfumed scarlet. And death had raised its banner on Broadway. The home of the murdered man was a place whose sounds had been geared down to the soft purr of wealth. The swish of the ankle-deep carpets, the flute-like trills of the parakeets taking the noonday sun in exclusive cages. The butler who murmurs you into the library and asks you to wait quietly. You don't dare open a book because turning a page would release a clap of thunder. And finally, when you'll wait no longer... The soft voice at your shoulder. I'm glad you made yourself at home, Mr. Clover. This is a difficult house to do that in. It's quiet. You can say that for it. You're... Harlan Lawson. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Oh, then the book's on this shelf. My one literary effort. All 20 copies. 20 copies of the same drivel. New Freedom, Pennsylvania, the utopia that failed. Nice binding, though, wouldn't you say? Quite. Expensive. That's my brother. He's everything you say. He gave me those when I got my Ph.D., made a grand gesture of binding my doctor's thesis and burying it 20 times over on the shelf. Every time he fingers the gold lettering, I tell him how grateful I am. You don't get along, you and your brother? We suffer each other. Let's put it that way. He has his world. I have mine. And uh, your world would be... The back alleys of poverty. You see, I'm in the nature of a failure, Mr. Clover. I'm a social worker. Doesn't pay very much. But I take in tears and give in exchange baskets of fruit, my brother's castaway clothing, and the gestures of sympathy they taught me in post-grad humanities. But you keep on living here with your brother, with uh, Earl Lawson. I exist here. 
Is this why you came, Mr. Glover? To run your hands over my brother's library? To probe into me? Or is it... <laughs> no, no. Don't say to me Earl has somehow run afoul of the law. Don't say it, because I wouldn't believe it of Earl. He's dead. He was murdered. Your manner of saying it. You leave me nothing but to believe you. He was stabbed, left lying on the street in Times Square. He must have shuddered that it found him in a place like that. I'd swear he shuddered. Your brother dies and that's how it hits you? To each his own way, Mr. Glover. You're implying that it was I who killed him? Let's play it that way for a while. I've dreamed the wish sometimes, but I couldn't have killed Earl. I slept the morning through. Earl's butler will testify to that. He was serving me brunch when you came in. Expensive brunch with wine. Who else would want your brother dead? Besides me. That would be your thesis, wouldn't it, Mr. Clover? I suggest the scholars approach... Yeah, you. thanks. I'll try. Then back to headquarters and to the desk. Get on the phone, make inquiries, send out to the newspapers for files, read them, digest them, extract them. Start a file of your own, label it Earl Lawson Homicide. Fill out the form, date of birth, hour of death. Murder by sharp instrument to be filled out in detail by the coroner. And on the lines on the bottom of the page, the incidental information. Jot down the phrases. A self-made man, shrewd financial mind. Known enemies, probably many due to financial manipulations. Send out for coffee in the sandwich because it's suddenly nighttime. And read some more. Then your door opens and Sergeant Tartaglia is all business. Lady to see you, Danny. What does she want? She knows who killed our Lawson. What? She says she Bring her knows. in. This way to see Danny Clover, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Peggy Drake, Lieutenant. Please sit down. Close the door, Tartaglia. All right, all right, you can stay. Miss Drake, the sergeant said you know... Not exactly. Danny, she told me she knew all about it. She said... What's that... on your mind, Miss Drake? I have the murderer's picture. Here. Here it is. Yeah. How'd you happen to take this picture? Well, I'm here on vacation. This afternoon was a good day to take pictures, and I was at Times Square. I took a lot of pictures, and... Well, this is one of them. You can see for yourself. Yeah. I found a store with six-hour developing service, and I got them developed. I was looking through them, and I saw this one. That's why... Yeah. I... Come here, Tartaglia. Look at this. Ray Brewer. That's right, Ray Brewer, sticking a knife into Earl Lawson on Times Square. Call records, Gino. Get the last known address on Ray Brewer. And anything else they've got interesting. I guess I did help with that. I don't know how much. Records. This man here with a knife. His name is Ray Brewer. A known hoodlum. A record of every misdemeanor on the books. Yeah, yeah, I got a pencil. Wait till my society back home hears about this. I belong to the literary society. We have open forums. I suppose this will be in the papers, what I mean, won't it? Front page, probably. What else is what else? Yeah, what's happened to him lately? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How are you making out, Gino? In a minute, Danny. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got all that. We appreciate it, and thank you. Very interesting, if I may comment on the material gathered from records. What's interesting? Up until a week ago, Ray Brewer was confined to the county hospital for incurables. Yeah, I remember. He was a pretty sick man. Incurable? His heart. Docs gave him a month to live. But last week, he was discharged from the hospital. How come? To die in the bosom of his family, as the records guy phrased it. Where is this family? 1212 West 16th, the man says. Where you going, Danny? See that Miss Drake gets home, Gino. I'm going to pick up a killer. Shh. Open up, Brewer, or I come in anyway. Brewer? Where are you, Brewer? <laughs> huh? Out here, Danny. Taking my ease on the fire escape, watching you. Watching you spill out your strength. 
Throw away the gun, Ray. They tell me you've got a month. If you throw the gun away, maybe you can live a part of it out. All of it. It's arranged. I live all of it. 30 days, Hathray Brewer. <laughs> if I come out after you, Ray, it'll cut your time down to a half minute. You make me shake with fright. Stay where you are, Danny. I'll bring it to you. The gun, Ray. Now, don't drool, kiddo. You'll get it. Funny, when you rang the doorbell, I thought it was a boy from Milford's, but no, it was you. How come you find me so lightning quick, Danny? A girl, a visitor, got your picture sticking a knife into Lawson. <laughs> I never could learn to be camera shy. Poke a camera in my nose, I smile for all birdies. Turn your back to me, Danny. I feel a new smile coming out. Listen to me. You... you don't turn your back, you bleed in the face. Turn. You did that, you brought sunshine into my short life. <laughs> One for the road. <laughs> It splintered through me, puncturing, ripping into the dark cells where pain lay waiting for it. Being released, scurry darted through me, opening endless doors on endless hurt. These new ones took over, finally. Gave up, because they'd overdone it. I couldn't feel it anymore. And then the hall wind cold on the sweat that had drenched me. And looking for Brewer, knowing he wasn't there. And calling to headquarters and tell them to put out an all-points bulletin on Ray Brewer. And then to Park Avenue to ask a question. Why had Brewer wanted Lawson dead? What had Lawson been to a hoodlum like Brewer? Help me. In my back. It's in my what? back. Help me. I... You didn't. You didn't. Help. Down the long hall, I could see the parakeets preening, pecking into their clipped wings. The new stillness of the man lying there with a knife in his back. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Dead. The nap of the thick rug furrowed where his hands had tried to tear life out of it. And suddenly, the, the flute song of the parakeet started again. And it wasn't still anymore. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The sensational young tenor, Mario Lanza, will take the place of Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen on CBS while the famous pair are on summer vacation. Mario Lanza starts his new series tomorrow, and he'll be heard each Sunday this summer on most of these same stations. And while Jack Benny is off for Korea, Guy Lombardo and his orchestra will be on hand to entertain you in CBS familiar Jack Benny time. <laughs> Last year's bride mannequins are dusted off, brought out of Broadway's basements, propped up on a rod, and arranged tenderly at the side of last year's groom mannequins. And Broadway knows June is passing through. It presses its nose against the shop window, sighs at the cascade of white satin flowing slowly over the wax figure, sheds a tear at the coronet of cloth lilies of the valley, and blows its nose for the sweetness of it all. It's the time of youth, the two-week romp in the Catskills, the burial in the sand at Far Rockaway, the breathless ecstasy on the heights of the roller coaster at Coney. And for the stay-at-homes, other sweets, other delights, the subway ball games, the band concerts in the mall, the moon-burned girls in the dark grass, and the my-hand-in-your-hand talk about two brothers dead of knife wounds. Summertime talk. <laughs> At headquarters the next morning, it was difficult to talk about anything because Sergeant Tartaglia had his mouth full of tacks and his fist full of hammer. Building something, Gino? Oh, it's you, Danny. Yeah, you might say I'm building... I'm building a site for sore eyes. Oh? You mind if I look? Oh, my pleasure. 
pardon me for obstructing your view. Nice. I think so also. A pin-up picture of Mrs. T hammered to the door of my closet. This I consider a worthy hobby. Mrs. T? I call Mrs. Tartaglia that whenever I'm in a hurry. Mm. <laughs> consider her, Danny, in her Catalina swimsuit, Jones Beach underneath her, the Tartaglia progeny forming a garland of angels at her feet. Ah, nice family picture, Gino. Uh, you mind taking the tax out of your mouth now? So as I can tell you about Ray Brewer, huh? So as you can do that. Naturally. Uh, permit me to close the closet door on Mrs. T first. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and... <clears throat> well, nothing on Brewer, Danny. The hoodlum killer is still at large. All points bulletins have been nothing, sent. Nothing, huh? Bread and butter, there is something. I forgot. The Milfords, of which the hood spoke to you, is Milford's haberdashery on Madison Avenue. But Roman Curcio traced it down after thousands other Milfords. It seems... I'll check it. Well, don't go away, Danny. I got something else. Another pinup? You might say that. Remember that Peggy Drake came in here with the snapshot of Brewer killing Lawson? What about her? Precinct 12 picked her up last night running down East 60th Street in her, you should excuse the expression, negligee. What? Was someone running after her? The precinct boys asked her the same question. She said no. She said she dared herself to do it, and she took the dare. So the boys decided on a small fine and let her go. A lonely girl in the big city. Sometimes it hits them that way. All right if I leave now? You always leave me, Danny. I'm used to it. Go, Danny. Good morning, sir. Is someone helping you? I'm looking for Mr. Milford. Mr. Milford is dead. What? Twelve years ago. Like that. Zoop. He was discussing plans with a buyer and... I know. Zut. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Milford, Jr. May I be of some service? I'm from the police. I want some information. Oh, uh, what is it you want? The police department called you a while ago. You said you had some dealing with a man named Ray Brewer. Oh, uh, yes, I did. I did indeed. You want to tell me about it? I don't see why not. Then tell me. Uh, surely. Last week, Mr. Brewer entered Milford's and was fitted for a complete outfit from linens to warachas. Warachas? Uh, Bootery a la Mexico. Mr. Brewer was going to Mexico. Note that I said was. Note that. Mr. Brewer changed his mind, huh? Well, that's a man's right. Mr. Brewer decided to stay around the city. Thus, he cancelled the Mexican clothes and ordered town wear. Uh, gabardines. And he paid you? I only ask because it's been bandied about that Mr. Brewer is not a wealthy man. His uh, friend paid me. The friend who was with him when first he ordered. Uh, this friend? Here, this man's picture in the newspaper? The very one. Dreadful clothes, not ours. Is he from here in town? What's his name? It says right here, Harlan Lawson. Hmm. PhD. It says this chap was murdered. That's right. Do you have any idea why Mr. Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico? None. He was so delighted, too, the, the first time he was in here. Showed me a travel brochure put out by the airplane people. Uh, Central American lines, I think. I I've been to Mexico, you know. Uh, ridden on a donkey. Thanks, Why, I Junior. Thanks a lot. May I be of service to you, senor? I think so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, my privilege. Uh, you wish to tour Central America to observe our police methods? Mm. It can be easily arranged. I will speak to the Latin consul. I, I just want to know about Ray Brewer. Uh, about Brewer? Uh, Brewer. Ah, the name has a familiarity. Uh, see, si, see, si, Senor Brewer. The man who wished to live out his days in Mexico, the land of tradition and romance. He's a murderer. You think you'll make him? What a dying man sets his heart to do is difficult to restrain him from, Senor. Uh, this from my father, I learned. But... Senor Brewer will not make Mexico by way of Central American lines, Senor. Of this, I am certain. Tell me why. Because only yesterday he canceled the ticket. It took me so long to prepare. He canceled the tour I had mapped for him. Acapulco, Zapateca, the floating gardens. When Brewer such... came in here to arrange his trip, was he alone? Uh, with another gentleman who subsidized the excursion. This one? In the newspaper picture? Mm, see, si, see, si, this one. Uh, Dr. Lawson, a gentleman of refinement. 
now dead, I perceive. Yeah. Brewer didn't give you an address by any chance. Oh, no, no, no. He simply took the cancellation money, told me he preferred your city, as who would not? You peddle tickets to romantic places and you like it better here, huh? Who would not? Why pay extra fare, senor? Romance is where you find it. Oh, come in, Muggerman. Sit down. Oh, Got anything? Nothing. Guy Brewer's hiding someplace. Where, I can't even begin to guess. Nobody knows anything. Stool pigeons, old friends of Brewer's, not a thing. Uh, if he gets out of the city, it's going to be tough. Yeah. How do you figure it, Danny? Figure what? Well, this, the case, the killing of the Lawson brothers. You know what I mean. You piece it all together, it comes out easy. Show me. Sure. Harlan Lawson wanted to get rid of his brother. He... For money? Maybe, but more than that, I think. Earl Lawson was a man who beat up the world. Harlan just stood there and cried for it. Well, Harlan was a social worker, Danny. He probably did a lot of good where it counts. Sure he did. But I met Harlan. It's the way he impressed me, Muggerman. He felt sorry for himself. Uh -huh. So he finds a little hood like Brewer hires him to kill Earl. Like you said, Harlan was a social worker. Brewer was in a charity hospital. That's where they met. Harlan found out Brewer only had a month to live, promised him a fling that month in Mexico for killing Brother Earl. Well, then why did Brewer turn around and kill the hand that fed him, if we go on the assumption that he killed Harlan, too? Well, Brewer killed twice, all right. The knife in Harlan matches the stab wound in Earl. He killed both brothers. But why? I don't know why he killed Harlan. Another thing I don't know is why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. If we found mm -hmm. that out... We... Danny, all I can say is, thank goodness. Well, then say it and sit down in a corner. Muggerman and I were discussing... It's the... about Peggy Drake. Peggy Drake? Say, isn't she the girl? Yeah, the girl who took the snapshot. She should have taken the snapshot and left the city. What? Just a few minutes ago, at five unto midnight, to be specific, she had a to-do with a cab driver. Tried to force him to take a wardrobe trunk in his back seat. Broke a window while so forcing. Quite a scene. The police suggested the moving company. And... And, and what? Well, give me a breathing spell, Danny. Whew. And Officer Padunik suggested his father-in-law and stood guard over the trunk until his father-in-law, the Murphy Movers, hauled it away. Thank Jeep as this girl leaves for her hometown of New Freedom, PA, in the morning. Where? New Freedom, Danny. The trunk has already left by Murphy Trucking Company, and the girl, Peggy Drake, leaves tomorrow. For which leaving, the police only again wave the finger under her nose. Highway Patrol, Muggerman, pick up that van. Escort it back to Peggy Drake's place. Right there. What do you know? So that's why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. Then I waited. It was a little less than an hour when the phone call came. The Highway Patrol had picked up the van at the entrance to the Delaware Bridge. There was plenty of time. Time to grab a bowl of chili and walk over to the 60s and to the rooming house where Peggy Drake was staying. Inside, the banisters of the staircase had been worn smooth by a thousand respectable hands, and the color had just begun to drain from the flowers and the wallpaper. On the third floor landing was a trunk. Beside it, Detective Muggerman. She's in there, Danny. She know we're here? We talked loud. She knows. Stay with the trunk, Muggerman. Okay. you, Mr. Clover. Glad you're here. Come in. Please, come in. What goes on in your town? I don't understand you people. Something wrong, Peggy? It was all that noise a little while ago. I opened my door a bit. I saw my trunk. Explain it to me, Mr. Clover. You were sending it back to New Freedom, huh? Of course, where I live, where I came from. That's where you met Harlan, wasn't it? What's he got to do with I need some sleep, Mr. Clover. My bus leaves early tomorrow. You're not leaving. You want to bring your trunk back in here and unpack? I'm not leaving. Wait a minute. Margovan, bring that trunk in here. What are you doing? I don't have to unpack. It's pretty heavy, Danny. I'll need some help. Okay. I'll give you a hand. Yeah. You better grab the handle on the other side. Okay, Danny? Uh-huh. Wait outside. Yeah. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. How long did you plan to stay in New York, Peggy? Four days. You needed a trunk that big for a four-day trip? That's a brand-new trunk, Peggy. Yes, I just bought it. It's for things I want to take home. Books, lamps. Books, huh? I like books. Let's see what you bought. Don't open that! Don't! 
Why not, Peggy? Leave me alone. What's the girl have to do? I come here for a good time. I'd say you had quite a busy trip. Running down the street at night in a negligee. I had something to drink. I didn't know what I was doing. Then creating a stir with this trunk with a cab driver. It wasn't my fault. People here aren't helpful. Peggy, we're looking for a man, Ray Brewer. We want him for two murders. Brewer? You know him, Peggy. You took his picture. Brought it to me. Oh, that's right. I remember his name. I'm sure you do. Let's open the trunk, Peggy. No. Don't. Get it out of here. Take it away. Later. You took the picture, Peggy, because you knew the murder was going to be committed. The murder you planned so well with Harlan. Get it out of here. Just get it out. Gave us a picture of the murderer. You figured by the time we found who he was, traced him, he'd be roaming around Mexico. By the time we got to him, he'd be dead. Because Ray Brewer only had a month to live. I didn't do anything. I didn't kill anybody. It was Harlan. One thing is bothering me, Peggy. Why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. He saw me taking his picture. We didn't tell him we were going to do that. You double-crossed him, huh? That's why he killed Harlan. That's why he was going to kill you. I ran from him. It's like a nightmare. Somebody grabbed me by the shoulders and choked me. And I was in the middle of the street. Dressed. Dressed. When you finally got back here, Ray Brewer was dead. He didn't live his month. His heart gave out. Let's open the trunk, baby. There he is, Ray Brewer. I won't look. I'm not going to look at him again. All the while I was putting him in there, staring at me, staring. And I couldn't get the trunk closed. His hand. I was alone, all alone. His face. Staring at me. <laughs> Dawn touches Broadway now. The remnants of the night are driven back into the earth. You walk the streets. From behind a doorway, you hear the old sound, the sound of weeping. You know the nighttime will never leave. It's found its refuge. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway is My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Totaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Peggy Weber was heard as Peggy Drake, Ted Osborne as Harlan Lawson, Anthony Barrett as Ray Brewer, and Don Diamond as Milford. For a full hour of outstanding musical entertainment, plus one of radio's biggest cash awards, play Sing It Again every week over most of these same CBS stations. Laugh along, win along with Jan Murray as he picks up his coast-to-coast telephone and invites you to sing it again and land a big batch of loot. It's exciting, it's outstanding radio entertainment. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde, Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. No end at all, no sense. 
sad goodbyes No fears, no tears No love that dies It sends a phoenix Sends a phoenix Let it always be Sends a phoenix Never ending The sun lit days The moon lit nights The sea, the sand The starry heights Are yours and mine forever Never end. 